Joining me now is Barbara McQuaid. She's a former United States attorney, a professor at the University of Michigan Law School, and an MSNBC legal contributor. Barb, thanks for being here on this very important issue. I want to ask about the right to privacy, that right that underpinned the Roe opinion. Let's take a quick listen to what Justice Sotomayor had to say about this concept during oral arguments last year. We have recognized that sense of privacy in people's choices about whether to use contraception or not. We've recognized it in their right to choose who they're going to marry. I fear none of those things are written in the Constitution. They have all, like Marbury versus Madison, been discerned from the structure of the Constitution. Why do we now say that somehow Roe versus Casey is, Roe and Casey are so unusual that they must be overturned? Barb, now that Roe is likely going to be overturned, how could other privacy rights be rolled back? Are we going to see states move to legislate away some of these other privacy rights? I think it's all fair game now, Katie. As Justice Sotomayor said there, uh, the same concept of this right to privacy is the underpinning of other decisions, like the use of contraceptives, interracial marriage, same-sex marriage. And so without those underpinnings, then it's all it's all up for grabs, I think. And, you know, she also raises such an important point here about the implied rights in the Constitution. Uh, there are unenumerated rights in the Constitution. There are all kinds of things that the Supreme Court has recognized, even though they're not written in to the words of the Constitution. The right to vote is not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, and yet courts have upheld that right as implied and necessary to the structure of the document. The presumption of innocence in a criminal case is not there. Executive privilege, qualified immunity, all of these things are presumed because in the structure of the document, it can't really exist without having these concepts there. So, uh, but if a court wants to simply erase it based on uh, their own opinion that it was egregiously wrong at the time it was decided, then really all of these rights are up for grabs. Yeah, Barb, you make such a good point, because some of the people that are cheering this possible outcome in the Dobbs case where Roe and Casey get overturned are saying, you don't see the right to an abortion, quote unquote, contained within the Constitution. So you and I know as lawyers that the courts are bound by or they abide by this concept of stare decisis, this whole idea of binding precedent. Does the possibility of a Dobbs ruling that comes out in a few months overturning Roe v. Wade basically get rid of or destroy this idea of stare decisis or binding precedent? I think it um, really undermines the concept. Uh, you know, there was a case, you may remember this, Katie, that came up in the late 90s, early 2000s called Dickerson. And it was reviewing the Miranda decision. Miranda was, a, of course, a case about the right to remain silent and to an attorney um, that's not contained in the Constitution. But the court said that to provide meaning to this Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate oneself, it's important that you know that right. Um, and so the case came up in uh, for review. And I think everybody had the same sort of dread that, well, the court wouldn't have taken this case up if they didn't have an intent to uh, change the law. And at oral argument, there were some hostile questions about Miranda warnings. Yet, nonetheless, the majority was written by Chief Justice William Rehnquist. And he said, if I were writing on a clean slate, I would eliminate Miranda warnings. But because of stare decisis and all the factors we're supposed to look at, whether people have come to rely on it in their lives, whether the standard has been workable, whether there's been any meaningful change in fact in law, based on all of those normal factors that we look at for deciding whether to overturn precedent, they're not present here. And so even though my opinion is that it was egregiously wrong, I don't have that right. It's not my choice. We follow uh, stare decisis in this country because, as Justice Louis Brandeis once said, it is more important that the law be settled than it be settled right. People rely on it in making their own decisions in their lives. And when you upend precedent, you create chaos in the legal landscape. And that chaos you speak of, Barb, my concerns are that this ruling that may become official in June will provide somewhat of a, a framework or maybe like a roadmap for this particular Supreme Court to follow in future cases to overturn precedent. Do you agree? 
I, I do. If uh, you know, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas has been using throwing this into his concurrent and dissenting opinions for a long time now, which is rather than look at these factors that the courts have relied on for centuries now in interpreting uh, the Constitution and relying on precedent, that we should be able to overrule any ver any decision that we just think was wrong. And so what that really does is simply make decisions uh, focus solely on the worldview of the justices who happen to be sitting in the seats at that time, as opposed to an institution that follows the rule of law. Barb, I want to play some sound from the court's five conservative justices, all saying that Roe is precedent and settled law. Let's take a quick listen. Do I have this day an opinion, a personal opinion, on the outcome in Roe versus Wade? And my answer to you is that I do not. But do you think there is as fundamental a concern uh, as legitimacy of the court uh, would be involved if Roe were to be overturned? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that there, the legitimacy of the court would be undermined in any case if the court made a decision based on its perception of public opinion. So a good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years. As Richard Fallon from Harvard said, Roe is not a super precedent because calls for its overruling have never ceased, but that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. It just means that it doesn't fall on the small handful of cases like Marbury versus Madison and Brown versus the board that no one questions anymore. Barb, that sound was critical, right? Because that's literally all of those justices before they were actually confirmed on the Supreme Court of the United States admitting under oath that Roe is settled law. There are some people that are decrying those voices and saying that that must be perjury, what they said. But how is it possible, Barb, for a nominee for the Supreme Court to be able to say to a United States senator that Roe is settled and then decide otherwise and do something totally different? Yeah, you know, you could never get away with what they said there in their own court. Uh, you know, in, in politics, uh, in media commentary, people can puff and hedge and mislead and deflect. But in court or when you're under oath, as they were to testify, they were, I think what they said I was characterized as literally true, but incredibly misleading. I mean, they never said, I commit to uh, refusing to overturn Roe. What they said is, it's a precedent. It's settled law. Uh, and what they, what they don't say is, and I'm willing to completely upend that because uh, of, of my personal views of abortion. And so it's, uh, it's really troubling, I think. Um, and, you know, we have had this tradition uh, since Justice Ginsburg went through the confirmation process of not di disclosing how a would-be justice, how a nominee might decide on a particular case. And so instead, we've allowed them to dance around the question with these kinds of answers about, you know, sort of legal mumbo-jumbo, uh, you know, it's set a law, it's a precedent. Um, and I think what we really need to do is to recognize that this is the playbook, that they're all kind of um, getting the same prep and watching the same videos and figuring out what will satisfy the senators so that they can just move on and get the confirmation with, and, and, and walk that tightrope. Maybe we need to ask some more probing questions about, and is it one you're willing to overturn? What would it take for you to overturn it? So um, I think that uh, we, we've been burned by this um, this uh, dissembling kind of an answer, and maybe we shouldn't take these kinds of answers going forward. You know, Barb, I'm a huge proponent of the idea of an overhaul completely of the judicial nomination <laughs> and confirmation process, because I think that lip service you talk about, listen, it could be applicable to both sides, but when it becomes something as critical as this, we all have to pay attention. Barbara McQuaid, as always, I thank you for your time and your insight. Thanks, Katie.